Good morning, Manitoba. I am Larry McIntosh, and I'll be your host for the next hour and every Saturday morning from 8 to 9. Thank you for tuning in. It's almost mid-October, so there's plenty of Manitoba-grown vegetables available at your local store right now for Thanksgiving dinner. Here's a list of the Manitoba veggies that will be available at your store. Are you ready? Beets, broccoli, kale, leeks, parsnips, carrots, green, red, and savoy cabbage, red onions, shallots, pumpkins, green acorn squash and various other winter squashes, red, white, and yellow pearl onions, and red, russet, and yellow potatoes. Look for the red and russet potatoes in our bright and colorful Sesame Street bags. They've just been out in the stores the last month or so. You can't miss them. We also have a line of Peak of the Market organic red, russet, and yellow potatoes, as well as organic cooking onions. Please remember, if it says Peak of the Market on the label, it is guaranteed to be grown right here in Manitoba. My guest this morning is Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Por- the Forks North Portage Partnership. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Larry. How are we doing? Real good. Yeah? Yeah. Never so, better, actually. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the Forks North Portage Partnership, which I have trouble with. Yeah, you know, a lot I, of people I, do. I just say the Forks, right? <laughs> you got to be real careful uh, sometimes when you say it. Yeah, really. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> so you were just promoted uh, about just over two months ago to CEO of the Forks North Portage Partnership. Ooh. Yeah, I've been in uh, in that role since August the 1st, okay. so it's uh, relatively new. Saying that, I've been with the organization for 20 years plus, so it's it's not like it's a, it's a complete surprise to me. So I meant to send you a card to congratulate you, but I'm doing it now. Okay, thanks. Congratulations it's much, on... It's, it's much better in person anyways. <laughs> I like to have that personal touch. Yeah, exactly. So the por- the Forks North Party Portage Partnership, I'm not going to have... I'm going to have a problem <laughs> with that all day. Can you explain... I, everybody knows what the Forks is, I think, but it's it's more than that. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, it is more than that. Uh, it, it started originally as the North Portage Development Corporation, and most people, uh, you know, if you don't know what that is, that's sort of the Portage Place environment, uh, investor syndicate, all the streets uh, around that uh, development that was really kind of 1985-ish. And in 1995, uh, the Forks and North Portage were put together as as one entity, and that's ah. where the Forks North Portage Partnership came into. Uh, Even into you have trouble saying yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I said it really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just an operating name, and it's a way of um, of uh, of expenses. You know, uh, the North Portage Development Corporation makes money; the Forks doesn't. So it's a way of. Uh, of uh, creating a sustainable organization. So the organization is owned by who? Well, it's actually a private development corporation, okay. but it is owned by the three shareholders. So it's an interesting tripartite uh, arrangement. Uh, the the feds, the province, and the city each own one share. Okay. But they appoint a board, and the board acts independently, and uh, I report to the board. I see. So you were saying Portage Place? Uh is that what you said? Sorry. Yeah, we own all the land in the in basically from Portage Avenue to Ellis and from Vaughan to Carlton, and uh, the, each of those projects on there uh, pays us a land lease. We also own all the parking that's there. There's over a thousand stalls in that in that uh, underground parkade underneath Portage Place. And, cer- and certainly everybody knows the Forks, and there's lots of development going on there. Would all, everything in the Forks be part of your group as well? Yeah, everything uh, at, at the Forks Renewal Corporation site, uh, which pe- most people are familiar with, uh, that's all falling under the same uh, the same entity. Hmm. So you have lots of things you oversee. There's lots going on. Yeah, in both properties, there's a lot going on. What is your favorite thing? Well, I think my favorite thing is that uh, every morning I get up and answer the phone, and, uh, you know, it's whatever comes next. Uh, It's kind of interesting. The Forks has become very accessible and top of mind for people, so anybody who's got an idea seems to to want to do it at the Forks, which is perfect. That's exactly how we like it, but uh, it it means we're uh, we're very busy just uh, working with people on on a lot of their projects. I think that's my favorite part because it's it's exciting. It's different every day. So when did the development at the Forks happen? How long ago was that? Well, the uh, Symington Yards, uh, which is where CN's main yard is now, they, they left the Forks precinct in about 65, something like that. And then the uh, basically they left a brownfield. It was a bombed out rail yard. Uh, so for about 20, 25 years, it, it, it sat like that. And uh, in the late 80s, the uh, development started at the Forks. And so the Johnson Terminal and the main building, the Forks, and all that started getting developed in the 80s? Yeah, really, the very first project was the National Park site. Very, oh. uh, A lot of people don't realize there's actually a federal park. It's basically the green 
uh, grassy areas by uh, along the Red River. There's some heritage interpretation and things like that going on there. That was really the first project. And um, then uh, the Forks Market was the first big project uh, undertaken by the, the corporation. And so that that old stable building was uh, was redeveloped into a market. And then when I started in 1991, the uh, we had just opened up the port so people could actually get down to the river walk. And, okay. and that's when the place exploded. Uh, people just started uh, arriving in, in the thousands. Because the first time I moved here was about 1984. And I left for a while and came back. But the Forks is such a, it's a meeting place, which I guess historically it is. But it's such a neat place to go down. It's got everything happening and the skateboard park and the theater and so much happening down there. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, what we're trying to do. And your uh, description of a meeting place is exactly our mission statement. That's what we're all about. Uh, So we use a number of, you know, themes to create that meeting place, whether it's commercial or recreational or entertainment or events, those kind of things, just so that uh, people use that that facility, the, that acreage, to uh, come down and meet. And that we find with our surveys, that's our number one uh, response that we're getting. People are just coming down to do what they call the Forks thing. They just come. To, they don't really have anything in mind. They just come down to hang out at the Forks. Really, it's people watching other people is uh, the number one attraction. We'll be right back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership, after we take this break for your 680 CGB weather update. Welcome back to Food and Friends. I hope you've heard about the Farm to School Manitoba Fundraiser. This fundraiser is open to all Manitoba schools and all licensed daycares anywhere in Manitoba. Basically, the fundraiser works like this. The students sell bundles of Manitoba-grown vegetables to raise money for their school or daycare. Bundle A has carrots, cooking onions, and red potatoes and sells for $10. Bundle B has larger packs of carrots, red potatoes, and cooking onions, as well as green cabbage and parsnips, and it sells for $20. Each bundle comes with a great reusable shopping bag that you can use when you go grocery shopping. And the great thing about this fundraiser is that the school or daycare keeps half the selling price, a 50% profit, which is great for any fundraiser. Last year, this fundraiser raised over $400,000 for Manitoba schools and daycares, and that's what they kept was $400,000. This fundraiser runs until December 12th and is open to any school or daycare anywhere in Manitoba. If you're interested in getting more information on this uh, Farm to School fundraiser or to register your school or daycare, please visit their website, farmtoschoolmanitoba.ca, or we have a link at our website at peakmarket.com. We're actually uh, having a very special Thanksgiving edition of Food and Friends on Monday, October 13th at 4 o'clock, and my guest will be Sharon Blady, the Minister of Healthy Living and Seniors, and I'm sure we're going to be talking more about the Farm to School Manitoba Veggie Fundraiser with the Healthy uh, Living Minister. We're back with Paul Jordan, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Partage Partnership. See, I went too fast again. So we're, we're just talking off air. We're talking veggies off air, which is going to surprise people, I'm sure. But you were saying that you actually have an orchard in that at the Forks? Yeah. Um, we had, uh, just north of the Children's Museum, we had a, a grove of Schubert choke cherries that got black knot disease. So we had to remove them all, and it was close to 30 or 40 trees. So mm. it left quite a, an open scar on the landscape. Um, and this idea came forward to regrow it as a public orchard. So uh, we have a big biocomposter on site. We're actually uh, composting all our vegetable waste at, at the forks. Out of the, uh, we, we tilled that into the soil and uh, planted an orchard, uh, which over the next few years will become a public orchard. People will just be able to go down and pick the fruit. Uh, hmm. So it's, it's an interesting way of dealing with the land. Um, what amazed me is just how many varieties of of fruit growing plants you can actually grow in Manitoba. I thought maybe, you know, you'd get the occasional raspberry and a crab apple, but uh, there you know, we're growing pears and quinoa beans or whatever they're called and you know, it, it's quite interesting just uh, how diverse that uh, you know, you it, how how diverse that crop can be. Hmm. Now, it's tough to do commercially, which is the business we're in, where we grow large quantities. So I know we grow apples in Manitoba, and we, I didn't know about pears, but tough to do on a commercial basis. But on a smaller scale, where people are coming down and can literally, they're going to be able to, take, to actually yeah, take some? Yeah, some? It's, it'll be a bit of a showcase. It's going to show just exactly, you know, a lot of the uh, nurseries are quite involved. And, they, hmm. you know, it's, it's it, the ability to show what we can actually grow in this climate. Uh, and, yeah, the whole idea is people can just 
pick it and uh, hopefully they learn a little something about it and uh, maybe grow it in their own yards or however it goes. So the forks you were saying in the last segment is kind of an area that people call you when they have ideas or, you know, there's been talk of a water park there. There's been talk about a whole bunch of things over the, those empty parcels of land, which are filling up now. You've got, obviously the Canadian Museum for Human Rights opened up not too long ago and it took up a big chunk of land. Is there still land left to develop? Yeah, and you'll see uh, in the next year, um, we have what's called the Railside Lands and uh, Parcel 4, which is where the water park was uh, was going to go. Um, That's right across from the Goldeye Stadium? Yep. Yeah, right okay. across from the Goldeye Stadium. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you look at that big surface parking lot that's just to the south of that, that's all ours. It was never intended to be, remain a surface parking lot. It's one of our last development sites. It's about seven acres. Uh, the Parcel 4 is also about seven acres. Uh, so we're just going out right now with public consultations and uh, with a design concept uh, on a creating really more forks uh, in those areas. Um, there will be a residential component. You know, it will be a mixed-use commercial area. Mm. It should be quite exciting. It will be uh, int- lots of public space, lots of big promenades. Uh, so it's, it's going to be quite interesting to watch that develop over the next 10 years. Now, going back several years, one of the... Concerns people had was parking at the forks. Now we we haven't had problems with the parking parking down there, whether it's on the the street or the lot or the parkade. Is that still a concern or? Well, parking's always an issue. It's yeah. a it's a tough one because uh, most of the parking at the forks is free. Uh, to do this development, we're going to have to formalize it and build more parkade like structures, okay. which are extremely expensive. I imagine. So free parking in expensive structures, the math doesn't quite <laughs> add up. So that's one of our biggest challenges is how we're going to deal with all that. Um, so that's one of the things we're on we're uh, we're looking at right now is, you know, exactly how much parking do we really need, uh, and then just how we're going to build it and where it goes. But if you look at developments in other cities, uh, I'm, I'm thinking Calgary is a downtown area. I, I'm assuming the parking is not free in a lot of these areas. They would pay something. Yeah, and that's sort of the, one of the things we're going to have to wrestle with yeah. uh, is just exactly how we do that. It has been free parking at the Forks for 25 years. To take something away is always difficult, but saying that... Uh, any revenues we have from our parking and from the site is just plowed right back into the fork. So, you know, your free events and all those kind of things that have. We maintain everything. Uh, we have our own maintenance crews. We're, we're responsible for all the capital redevelopment. So really, uh, and we also pay full property taxes. So it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting arrangement. So we do need external revenues to help us pay for all this. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about your financials, but those are a lot of costs there, and you don't get a lot of revenue in some cases. So that's an interesting uh, Yeah, yeah, it's great, for the, it's great for the shareholder. You know, they get all the taxes and don't have to provide any of the services. So uh, that's the way it was set up, and so far we've been able to pull it off. We'll be right back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership, after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. It's time for a recipe segment called Now We're Cooking. Now, you don't need to write this recipe down, as it is today's recipe of the day at peakmarket.com and in the Winnipeg Sun, so you can get all the information from today's Winnipeg Sun or our website. Today's recipe is fast and easy Greek salad. Fast and easy Greek salad. And here's what you need for this recipe. Two cups of dried uh, uh, tomatoes, two cups of cucumbers diced, one cup of cubed feta cheese, half a cup of thinly sliced onions, and as always, for best results, use Manitoba grown onions, one quarter cup of black olives sliced, two tablespoons of white uh, wine vinegar, two tablespoons of olive oil, half a teaspoon of minced garlic, half a teaspoon of dried uh, basil, and half a teaspoon of dried oregano, and black pepper to taste. In a large bowl, combine the tomatoes, cucumbers, feta cheese, onions, and olives, and set aside. In a small bowl, whisk together the vinegar, oil, garlic, basil, oregano, and pepper, and then combine with the tomato mixture and toss gently to combine. And please make sure you chill this before serving. And this recipe serves for... Again, this recipe is fast and easy Greek salad, and it's the recipe of the day at peakmarket.com and in the Winnipeg Sun. And there's no way you could write all that down that fast, so check today's Winnipeg Sun or our website. And all the recipes on our website and the newspaper are both metric and imperial measurements. 
We'll be right back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership, after we take this break for your 680 CJOB news, sports, and weather. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. Being Thanksgiving weekend, we can all do something for those less fortunate than ourselves. For every person who downloads the free Peak Recipes app by October 31st, Peak of the Market Growers will donate 20 pounds of fresh vegetables, up to 1 million pounds, to the Winnipeg Harvest Food Bank. Peak of the Market's mobile recipe app works on your smartphone, including the iPhone 6, and on your iPad. And it's available free through the Apple, Android, or BlackBerry World app stores, or via peakmarket.com. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, all you have to do is go to any of these sites and search for Peak Recipes. And here's a few of the features in our new app. Over 4,000 recipes at your fingertips. No internet connections required, so once you've downloaded, it doesn't take a lot of space, but you don't have to worry about connecting the internet. All the recipes are right there. There's a recipe search using any combination of keywords like potatoes, beef, chicken, or ingredients and meal types. Measurements are both in metric and imperial. You can rate your recipes after you've tried them by the number of carrots you like and add the ones you like to a favorites list so you don't have to look them up every time they're in your own list. Add recipes to a shopping list and check it off as you shop. Add notes to the recipes like add more salt or it's Larry's favorite. And you can even add extra items to your shopping list. One of the items I like is font resizing so you can make the directions larger, easier to read. And also the other one I like is there's no in-app advertising. So when you're on the app, there's no advertising. It's straight, straight recipes. We're very excited with our new mobile app. So please download it and try it. And I know there's thousands of apps out there, but give it a try. If you don't like it, you can always delete it later and you'll still out help out Winnipeg Harvest. We're back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership. So, something coming up called Winter Shortly. And I know the, the river trail comes up, just stops at our apartment, Shelly and I's apartment. Are you responsible for that whole river trail thing as well? Yeah, the Forks uh, uh, builds that, maintains it, and also programs it. Uh, we work with uh, Festival. They, they put right. some of the flavor into it. Um, but the Forks has been running that trail now for the better part of a decade. Oh, well. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a big deal. It's amazing how popular that has become. We, uh, two years ago, we counted 350,000 people over six weeks visited that trail. Uh, last year it was a little less simply because that was beyond winter. That was polar vortex. <laughs> I'm not, we invented a whole other season. <laughs> really? Uh, so it was, uh, we were down a little bit last year, but um, still uh, 200, 250,000 people skated that trail last year. So it's a very popular, very uh, nostalgic kind of uh, physical way of, you know, recreating. Now, it, as I said, it ends at our apartment uh, on the Assiniboine River, and we we look at it all the time. Our our apartment overlooks the river, and you see it's used well. And on occasion, not last year, but the year before, I think we we kind of walked the trail because I don't skate, but it's a beautiful walk down there. You're kind of in out of the wind a little bit. You can walk down to the forks, obviously. It's very nice. Right, the Assiniboine is really the better part of the trail. It's much more sheltered, and because of the uh, mm. it's it's a narrower river, so it's a little more intimate. Um, some years we can get much past the Wellington Hugo area. We've been as far as Assiniboine Park, uh, which is a really cool uh, connection because they start, you know, the River Heights and St. James, they all start using the trail. Um, so that's our intention every year. The rivers have not been cooperating the last few years, so we haven't been able to get out there. But uh, that's certainly the intent. We'll try and get out there. That's a long run for our Zamboni. But, uh, yeah, really? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, when, it, when we can pull it off, we really see the, uh, the visitations really start to ramp up. You know, I know we had a competition years ago against Ottawa, you know, who has the longer, and, and that's that's interesting, and it makes for good, you know, press and everything else, but it's really about using the, the forks and using the rivers, and you have other things going there as well. Did you have a, a pop-up restaurant going on down there? I don't know if that was you or not, or? Yeah, no, that's definitely us. Okay. Uh, it, well, it's, a, it's a, a group that comes to us, but we facilitate that thing and help them build it, and it'll be back again this year, and it's very interesting. It's called the Raw, it's called Raw Almond. But it's a pop-up restaurant in the uh, at the junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. It's very high end. You know, it's you know it's a hundred bucks a, a meal. Um, but they are sold out uh, before they even open. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting, and uh, it's interesting because it's not about parking and it's not about weather. It's about the experience. People are walking a long way in you know thirty below conditions to uh, to have a meal in this restaurant. So it's really captured a. Uh, you know, uh, the imagination of, uh, of folks, uh, people are lined up to try and 
get into get a ticket into there. And then they have celebrity chefs. Uh, Vige from Vancouver came last year and mm. cooked for four nights, and so it's a it's a really interesting uh, uh, experience, and has become an international sensation. People are are aware of it all over the world and are booking to come and. Uh, to actually see what it's like to have dinner in 30 Below, and not only dinner, but a high-end dinner in 30 Below. And I think the great thing about uh, Manitobans is, you know, yeah, winter's tough. There's no question about it. We have winter. It's going to come every year. But we celebrate winter in, in ways like this. The skating, and there's some hockey games that go on down there on occasion, the eating outside. To me, it's always amazing me, the fireworks at the Forks. Every year. You know, December 31st is going to be pretty chilly, and you get good crowds out for that. Sure. Uh, you know, it, it's about now that we notice people are a little uh, gun-shy, and we don't see them coming down to the forks, but after a while, they get used to it, and they're out. Uh, the great thing about being outside is it's such a recreational place, and, you know, once you're out there and moving, kids have always shown everybody how you do it. You just go outside, and you don't care about the wind chill or anything. You just start having fun, and you start moving your body, and, uh, you know, things aren't quite so cold anymore. So uh, I think people are catching on to that, and uh, really winter's a beautiful, wonderful time to be outside. The air is fresh, the snow's on the ground. I, I really enjoy it, and uh, more and more people are. And, and uh, I'm, I'm from Toronto originally, and Toronto doesn't get the cold weather we get, but it's that damp cold that I find yeah. gets into you. Here you can dress in layers. You know it's going to be cold. You're going to zip up your jacket. Yep. But it's sunny, well, during the day, obviously. <laughs> it's sunny, and it, I find it much more pleasant. Yeah, it, it really is. And, um, you know, it can get a little dicey out on the on the trail. People really have to watch the wind, you know, sure. because when the wind's behind your back, you skate like a demon, and you feel like you can go forever. And right. then you turn around, and oh, my gosh. it's uh, It was funny. Uh, uh, the first year we went out to Cinnaboyne Park, um, you know, that's a, that's a 12 kilometer skate or more. People were getting out there and then I was talking to Transit, the bus drivers, and they're saying it's, it's hilarious. They've never taken more people back with skates on <laughs> from Cinnaboyne Park back to the Forks. So people would get all the way to Cinnaboyne Park and then they didn't have the, you know, the gas to get all the way back to the Forks. So they just climb up the bank and get on a bus and come back with, and of course, they just had their skates right. on. So it was a very funny story. But he said there was hundreds of people on the bus. And I get how that could happen. I didn't realize it was 12 kilometers. Yeah, that's, it's, that's... A, it's, a, it's a big skate, So, uh, uh, but well worth doing. And do you have any new plans for winter this year outside? Well, every year we, um, we run our warming huts competition. It's oh, an nice. international competition. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting competition because we get over 200 entries from all over the world. Uh, we have to get it down to three. Uh, uh, and it's interesting to see how the rest of the world sees us. Um, this year we've got close to 200 a applications again, and a lot of them are from Africa. So it's very interesting to see how a warmer climate views a colder climate. Um, so it w that the, the jury is, is, uh, is about to meet soon, and we'll, we'll select it and roll it out. We've got a, uh, we, we invite a celebrity architect every year. This year it's uh, Michael uh, Roykin from Mexico City. So he, he's one of the world's leading architects and uh, is very interested in working in this climate. That's fascinating. We'll be right back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership after this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. I want to remind you to take a minute on <laughs> on Wednesday, October 22nd, to vote in the municipal election. If you're busy that day, you can even vote early at many locations. I know Shelley and I voted last Saturday after the show because we might be busy on October 22nd. But as a citizen of Manitoba and Canada, it is a privilege to have the option of voting. So I want to encourage you to please exercise that privilege and get out and vote before the 22nd or on the 22nd. We're back with Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership. So Shelley and I have voted already, so we, we've got that done. But we got to make sure we get people out. One of my pet peeves is that, you know, we're in a country that can actually vote. Many countries would love that right, and, and we don't know, always take advantage of that. We, we were talking off the event. Do you have some national event off the air, I should say? you have some national event coming up? Yeah, it's called the uh, Cyclocross Championships. Cyclocross. Cyclocross. Okay. Uh, and it's an interesting, uh, it's basically a bicycle race. Uh, but it's very compact, you know, like Tour de France, you can watch and, you know, it goes by and, you, you know, it takes 30 seconds and that's kind of it. It goes on for another 200 kilometers. But the cyclocross is, uh, it's a very complicated course. It's going upstairs, across sand, over grass, and there's times where you're, you're getting off your bike and running with it. And, uh, it's hmm. becoming a big participation sport. 
Uh, it's one of the world's fastest growing sports, uh, and it's very spectator oriented. So it's a great one to come down and actually watch the competition that goes on. They have, of course, different classes, and there's the professionals are coming from all over North America to actually race it. There's also more family oriented and celebrity oriented events, but it's a really a uh, great spectator event. So if ever uh, you're it, when you see it at the Forks, you should come down and watch. It's uh, it's always exciting, you know, uh, and you'll see locals as well as professionals uh, racing. So when is this happening? Uh, you know, that's a really good uh, question. Thank Larry, you. Which <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, I'm not the detail guy. Oh, the Forks. <laughs> is, it, is it the next year? It's the end of October. Okay. So we're, we're, yeah, 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 okay. Like 27th or whatever those dates are. I'm sure we can go to the website yeah, and find it, out. It's there. So it's it, this month. Okay. Yeah, and there'll be lots of, uh, you'll see lots in the media on it. Uh, it is a pretty exciting event. And I know the cycling community in Winnipeg is really pumped. Hmm. So but with the, when you look at people coming to the Forks, and we're going to deal with the Forks because that's the one I know I'm most familiar with, um, do you see a lot of tourists? We're doing about 4 million visits a year, uh, which is exceptional when you consider uh, uh, where we are and what, you know that we're only a city of 700,000. Um, of those 4 million, I would say probably 2 million are tourists, and they're coming mostly in July and August. Uh, our surveys show that really everybody that comes to Winnipeg uh, ends up at the Forks, whether they're coming down with family that they're visiting or whether they're just coming to uh, to uh, see what the city's like. So uh, we're a big tourist destination, uh, and really our numbers are, are exactly what uh, the numbers are of tourists coming to Manitoba. Hmm. Yeah, because I was going to say that if we have family or friends or customers come to town, there's three or four things that we have to do, and the Forks is one of them, Cinnamon sure. Park, et cetera. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights will be one now. Uh, but you want to get out and show them these things, and uh, you're it, proud of them, right? Yeah, they, we are proud of them, and they are fabulous uh, amenities. And uh, now the CMHR, which, of course, is at the Forks, uh, will be another one of those. So it's uh, even more reason to come down to the Forks. It's a beautiful building. Uh, as soon as you go inside it, you realize it's been worth everything. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, uh, theme and message that uh, that they're uh, imparting. And, and I think, uh, and we've talked about it on the show before, I think it's going to attract a lot of people to Manitoba. I think people are going to come for that, do a lot of other things while they're here. But I've never had so many people talk about Manitoba and our travels across North America as they have about the museum opening up and how they want to come visit. Well, there's so much, many layers of society that will come to see this building, you know, there's the architects who are absolutely uh, fascinated with the building and the interior. There's the, the uh, you know, the human rights advocates. There's the people who want to learn. There's the tourists. So there's a number. It, yeah. it, it works on a whole number of fronts. So you were talking earlier about uh, looking at the parcel of land that you have. Uh, that's in consultation now with the public, or has it started? Or? Yeah, we've uh, done several public consultations over the summer. Uh, very positive. Um, lots of good feedback. Uh, the next realm, the next realm of public consultations that we're about to enter into is, you know, what are some of the things that would happen in this place? Why would you go there? What are the 10 big ideas? Uh, how do you create a community? What are the things that go into it? So that's the next, uh, the next layer of consultation that we're about to do. And I'm, I'm going to guess that you probably have lots of passion when it comes to talking about that area because everybody feels like it's theirs, right? It's, they're, yeah. If they're proud of it, as we said earlier, it's a meeting place, but it, everybody has some ownership in it in some way. Exactly, and I think that's where the whole water park discussion uh, demonstrated that. People have a very strong opinion of what should be at the Forks, and that's our job is to try and filter through all that through the public consultations because, of course, there's the... There's one end which just wants green park space, and then there's the other end that wants uh, much more uh, built environment. So we have to balance those two and uh, try and land on something that uh, that people are are happy with and uh, have a vested interest in. We've done a pretty good job over over the last 20 years. That's what the Forks has become. It's become a place that people are uh, are, are 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 feeling that they own and that they've contributed to. So we, we want to continue that. So what's your biggest challenge, you think, over the next year? Well, I think the biggest challenge over the next year is figuring out the financial model for this thing. Mm -hmm. It's extremely uh, challenging. Uh, we need lots of partners, the city, uh, Center Venture, uh, the province. Everybody's got to pitch in and help us figure this thing out. Um, you know, money just isn't growing on trees. Right. Uh, so we need to, uh, this needs to be financially sustainable. It needs to be environmentally sustainable, and it needs to be sustainable as a community place. 
And those are a lot of uh, big bills to fill. Yeah, they as, are. As, so that's going to be the big challenge. There's a lot of check boxes yeah, now. There's, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's probably hundreds of them. <laughs> well, I, I think I think the the whole the Forks area is fantastic. I know the North Portage Partnership area you were talking about earlier is is an area that there's parkades in there. There's lots of land that you lease. It's it's quite a large area of responsibility you have, and I want to take my hat off to you because mm-hmm. I think it's an amazing thing, and it's it's a jewel of our city. So congratulations. We'll be right back with Paul. Jordan, Chief Executive Officer of the Forks North Portage Partnership after we take this break. Welcome back to Food and Friends. We have a special Thanksgiving Day edition of Food and Friends on Monday, October 13th at 4 p.m. My guest will be Sharon Blady, the Minister of Healthy Living and Seniors. So please join me Thanksgiving Monday at 4 o'clock and, of course, every Saturday morning from 8 to 9. My guest today has been Paul Jordan, Chief Executive Officer for the Forks North Portage Partnership. You know, this has been a lot of fun. We've had a lot of stuff to cover in an hour here, and we haven't even scratched the surface of the things you have going on. Yeah, so uh, I'll obviously have to come back if you'll have me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> there's a whole number of themes, uh, you know, f- uh, on the cultural front and on the development front that we really haven't gotten into yet. Uh, it's important to talk about because this is Winnipeg's, you know, crown jewel, and it's their meeting place, and there's lots of input and and, uh, and ownership of that site. So I, I think it's worth discussing. Well, thanks, Paul, for being on Food and Friends. Okay, Larry, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to Nicole Bonnycamp, our show's producer, and Chad, our camera guy. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Take care, and please don't forget to eat your veggies.